All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Dan Goldman, and I am chairman of the Israel and World Jury Committee at Congregation Beth Emick. It is my honor to introduce tonight's talk, Secrets of the Negev, by our special guest, Dr. Stephen Rosen, Professor Emeritus at, of Archaeology from Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Dr. Rosen will be offering his personal perspectives on his work after wandering the wilderness for more than the biblical span of 40 years. At the end of his presentation, Dr. Rosen will be taking questions from the audience. If you're attending in person, just raise your hand. And if you're watching remotely, just type your question into the chat window and we'll read it out loud. And with that, let me turn the mic over to Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been talking to public groups for 40 years, actually 50. When I was in Chicago, I gave talks. And I'm gonna to talk to you about my own personal experiences and personal uh, adventures in doing more than 40 years of work in the Negev in, Israel, in Israel's Southern desert. This is just a personal perspective, my own secrets. And I'll start. What you see here is a cairn field, a tumulus field. Okay, um, so what you see on the screen right now is a cairn field. There are 30 large bur burial cairns. This is a site I excavated 20 years ago. It comes with desert shrines. I'm going to show you pictures of this, but you see those cairn fields, you can see them from kilometers away, 7,000 years old with uh, Neolithic burials in them. So if any of you saw the movie, The Dig on uh, BBC, on PBS, this is the kind of stuff, except mine's about 6,000 years older. <laughs> that was a mere Viking burial. Let me, let's start. Okay, let's, uh, there we go. Okay, so let me, let me orient you. Um, I'm in the Negev. The Negev is Israel's southern desert. One of the things I really hate is when people say the Negev desert. Negev means desert. So when you say Negev desert, you're, you're being redundant. And that's the area that I've been working for the last 40 plus years, uh, especially around the Machtesh Ramon, the Ramon crater, which is right in the middle of the Negev. And let's see, you guys get what? 25 inches of rain here, something like that? Maybe a little less. Um, the area I'm working is about just so you get an idea, and you'll see the landscape. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the, these craters, are a unique feature in the Negev. They give you Quite unique. We have them in Algeria, we have them in Sinai, but they're they're a special geological feature. Because it was fifty, right? I also want to give you an idea of, one, of the size. I got this from the Canadian uh, Israel Canadian Embassy uh, in Ottawa many years ago, and one student I had saw this and said, "Steve, you know, if Vancouver Island and a lot of times with well, it's not a little like island, but the rest of us in Canada wouldn't notice. That's how big Israel yeah, is." and the Negev is half that size. So try to imagine Canada and we have Israel. We think the scale. We're not talking about California. All of Israel is the size of New Jersey, and the Negev is half of that. And yet it's an incredible desert with an incredible history. And just to show you, with incredible natural features, this is the wall, the north wall of the, of the crater. It's an erosional cirque, by the way. It has nothing to do with impact craters or volcanic craters or glacial craters. It's an erosional cirque, an erosional crater. And that's just a view of the fog rolling in, just like over San Francisco, right? Uh, I went to Berkeley, so I remember the fog. Okay. A little bit about the history of the archeology span here. 
of the Negev because it's a cool history. The first people doing anything vaguely resembling archaeology came to the Negev in the beginning of the 19th century. And they were just explorers. The first person who was doing any kind of scholarship was a guy named Robinson, who was a Protestant minister from Andover Seminary, an evangelist. And um, well, I'll get to a picture of him in a second. These travel logs, these very early explorations are very important because they give us a record of what things looked like 200 years ago or 150 years ago. This is a picture, an ink, uh, a pen and ink drawing from the site of Shifta of Subeta. It's a Byzantine town in the central Negev. It was abandoned around 700 CE. This is a picture from 1869 by the Orientalist, the Oxford Orientalist, uh, Edward Palmer. And you can see this exact picture today. Okay, it's, it's amazing. This, is, this still exists. Uh, and it gives us a clue as to the fact that the site, even over the last 150 years, has not significantly deteriorated, except for the damage that archaeologists have done. Okay, so that's Robinson from Andover Seminary. We have Burkhardt, we have Seetzen, we have all of these guys uh, doing this exploratory work, which if we look at it today is really problematic. Uh, Edward Robinson, the guy who from that picture, was in Sinai searching for the uh, route of, uh, of Exodus. Um, Robinson was a biblical scholar, but a fundamentalist biblical scholar who found the, the patriarchs, of course. Nobody's found the patriarchs. That's silly, quite seriously. But that's what they were there for. Burkhardt was an adventurer who ended up uh, doing incredible work in Arabia. And his descriptions are phenomenal, descriptions of the Bedouin. Seetzen down at the bottom was a Swiss physician, uh, if I remember correctly. But he was the first one to get to Petra, which you see there, and which you're all, I'm sure, aware of from Indiana Jones, right? Um, so we have this very rich history. The science of which really begins with this guy, Flinders Petrie. Flinders Petrie was a British archeologist who certifiably one of the only geniuses, true geniuses in the history of archeology. span and he began, he dug at a site called Tel Hesse, which you see there in the screen. Uh, these are all pictures of Tel Hesse and Tel Farah South, but Hesse, 1891, 1892. It's the first Tel, a city mound. This is the Northern Negev, right? So I'm in the, I'm in the Negev here. 1891, the first person to ever excavate a Tel anywhere with proper stratigraphic control. Petrie understood that if you want to excavate properly and understand the history of civilizations, you have to separate the layers. You have to dig separating the layers. And his work can still be cited today. It's crude by our standards, but his work can still be cited today. Um, and he was the first person to actually dig stratigraphically and then associate collections of pottery with those layers. So he was characterizing each layer with its material culture. His, his theories were crackpot, but he was writing in the 1890s and his techniques were absolutely brilliant. Now he also invented archeological seriation. And I know there are a lot of people from the lab, from Lawrence Livermore lab, uh, so he had direct connections with uh, Pearson of Pearson's R. They lived in the same neighborhood in London. And he consulted with Pearson. And he was one of the very first people in practical applied sciences to do uh, um, iterating sequences, uh, 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 seriations. 
In America, that didn't happen until 1925. In American archaeology, it didn't happen until 1925. He did it in Egypt in the 1880s. I already talked about Edward Palmer, the desert of the Exodus. These are his maps. Um, Palmer had a fascinating history. He goes out, he was a, a, a true scholar. He spoke Arabic. He spoke a lot of uh, Semitic languages. He read the Bible in Hebrew, and he was out to discover Mount Sinai, to identify Mount Sinai, and to define the route of the Exodus. He wrote an incredible book called, uh, the, Wild, uh, no, called the Desert of the Exodus, 1869, the American version, 1872. Um, which we still use today before the observations, before a bunch of modern armies pass through, okay? Uh, oh, one thing about Palmer. The British sent him back in 1880 and he was murdered. And later on, T.E. Lawrence found his grave. So, you know, and of course, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Most people don't know that he was actually a trained archeologist. And in 1914, okay, just before World War I broke out, British military intelligence approached the Palestine Exploration Fund and said, we need some agents to make maps of Southern Palestine in case, which there was no in case, they knew a war was coming. And Lawrence, who had just finished his MA on Crusader castles in the Holy Land and spoke Arabic, and Sir Leonard Woolley, who was not yet Sir, but later became Sir, when he excavated at Ur, the famous Ur of the Chaldees, um, which you can see the finds of in the British Museum, uh, they were drafted or offered an opportunity they didn't know they were working for British military intelligence until about six weeks before. The, the connection, the, the, the uh, communications with British military intelligence and the PEF were quite a bit earlier. And about six weeks before they left, they were said, oh, by the way, you're making maps for the army. And they were joined by a guy named Newcomb, who was, I think at that time, a mere major could have been even a captain in British military intelligence, and he was out there as their map maker. Their maps were then used by uh, um, the British in the conquest of Palestine in uh, during the Se First World War. Uh, and then Woolley, uh, sorry, and Lawrence, of course, that was 1914. They're out there for six weeks. They did incredible maps. The plan they drew of the site of Shifta, which I showed you, which Palmer had visited was up until the 1960s in aerial photography, the best map of that site, the best plan of that site. So they did an incredible job. I won't go into the deep history. It's really fascinating. Uh, I don't have time, but this is a reform synagogue. You all know who Nelson Glick was. Nelson Glick was out there, 1930s, 1940s, doing pioneering survey work. Um, His, that, that basis still serves as the basic, not the basic framework, but one of the founders of Negev survey archaeology. Unfortunately, Glick tied everything literally to the Bible. And a lot of the stuff was way pre-Bible, but regardless. And Benno Rottenberg, uh, who I, I worked with a little bit, and of course, his excavations at Timna, which was not King Solomon's mines, but copper mines used by the Edomites and by the Egyptians and later on by the Romans. Okay, and his, and his work was pioneering. Okay, that's all background. Now I'm going to talk about my own stuff. And this is the site of Tilship. 1973, I was 19, and I went on a dig. My first real dig, I had worked at the Southern Wall for two days when I was 17, but I worked here for a month. And Yohanan Aharoni, 
who was then at Tel Aviv, who founded the Institute of Archaeology at Tel Aviv University, uh, was the first person to create a systematic program for foreign students to come and work and receive college credit at an archaeological dig in Israel. And I was one of the first people, I think the first project, the first group was 1971, but I was there in 73. And what you see are features of Tel Sheva. It's not biblical Be'er Sheva. If you read your Bible carefully, you will discover that there are two sites. One is Be'er Sheva, the infamous from Dan to Be'er Sheva, okay, the, the borders of, uh, of biblical Israel. And the other is a site called Sheva, which is a twin town, and this seems to be Sheva, okay, Saba. In, in Arabic, it was tell as Saba, without the Be'er, which means well. So these were just a few different things. When I was there, there are an incredible number of uh, pretty well-known archaeologists who trained there. Aside from the Israelis, I was there, a woman, a woman named Andrea Berlin, who uh, teaches at Boston University. Another well-known biblical archaeology named a biblical archaeologist named Elizabeth Block, and excuse me, ver various others. So we have this classic big biblical tell. And tomorrow at Lawrence Livermore, I'm going to give a virtual tour of this site. But there you see a picture of the tell after Aharoni's excavations. What you see is phenomenal. The amount of exposure. You see he's exposed almost the entire tell. When you dig a site, if you can expose 5%, you've exposed a lot. It's all a question of sampling. But he worked there for 10 years with a group every summer for two months with 150 volunteers. Okay, And um, he didn't get down to the bottom everywhere. This is really the, only the top level but it's one of the best views we have of what we might call a garrison town, an Israelite or Judean, better yet, Judean period garrison town on the Southern edge of the Judean kingdom. So we get great insights from here. Um, the young man you see there is named Tex. He uh, used to fall asleep at the dig. He was digging with me in another site. And then just views of the stratigraphy. I'm not going to uh, go into this in too great detail. What you see here are the storage rooms at Tel Sheva before they were reconstructed. They're much more useful to archaeologists in this way. So this slide is actually quite important because it documents the site before it was reconstructed. Tourists can't really see much when they see this. So it's all been reconstructed beautifully. But this uh, plays a role. You see some of the artifacts. Um, and you see the altar. And just a brief note about the altar. You see it's in these carved blocks. And you see it was, you see the walls of the storage houses. Aharoni found the altar in pieces where the blocks were reused as building material in those walls of the storage rooms. Storage rooms of seventh century, 600s, which means the altar has to be earlier. And um, basically what we're seeing is what appears to be Hezekiah's biblical reforms. It might be Josiah's biblical reforms, but the concentration before Hezekiah, you could sacrifice on the festivals in any number of different places. After Hezekiah, all sacrifices had to be performed in Jerusalem. Um, there are, the Bible tells us it was a, a revelation and all this kind of stuff, but obviously it was economic. Let's, let's, let's take control of the sacrifices. So Aharoni found that in little pieces and had this absolute fit of brilliance where he um, reconstructed it. Try to imagine that you find each of those blocks scattered around in the walls of the storage room. And you can get an idea of how brilliant that insight was. Um, just more, more views of Tel Sheva. 
and some of the finds from Tel Sheva. And people often ask me, what are some of the most exciting things that I found? That's the first pot shirt I ever found. Not the first pot shirt, the first pot. 1973, which I happened to take a picture of. And that's the picture of where I was digging in 2010. And it's been totally erased. And I tell my students when I give them tours of this site that it was a deliberate, deliberate attempt to erase all memory of my presence on the site. Sorry? Right here. You see it? There's a, a rim right there. Can we, can we turn down the lights a little? I mean, I don't need the lights. I'm, I'm, I'm not in charge of the uh, technical aspects of um, No, we can't see. No, no, no. Turn. Yes, but people online need to see it when you online. This is fine. This yeah. is fine. That, that, that's good. Okay. So now I want to give you another. Those, those are my, my initial experiences. I want to also tell you about the Negev beyond the Bible. Okay? Because the Negev actually plays this crucial role in world prehistory. What you see here is what we call a chopper, a chopping, uh, sorry, a chopping tool or a chopper. And the first place those that were ever identified were in Olduvai Gorge in East Africa. And they represent the earliest kind of stone tools anywhere. In Olduvai Gorge, we're in other sites in East Africa. In Olduvai Gorge, they're about 1.8 million years old. In other places, we have them going back more than 2 million years old. In the Negev, they're only, wait a second. That one is from Stable Care, uh, from Nahatsin, and that's about 1.8 million years old. And that is amongst the earliest evidence we have anywhere for people going out of Africa. Human beings evolved in Africa. Uh, different species of human beings evolved in Africa. Homo sapiens sapiens evolved in Africa. But this is one, this is evidence for the very earliest migration of people out of Africa. We have a number of the, they're not good sites. They're, the sites themselves are destroyed, but we can easily identify the artifacts. The artifacts because they're rock, they don't decay. You see in the lower right corner, my, yeah, your lower right, uh, hand axes, those are a mere half million or three quarters of a million years old. We have a rich record of prehistoric archaeology. Archaeology before any writing, before civilization. Archaeology even before Homo sapiens. Archaeology of hunter-gatherers uh, prior to the Bible in the Negev. And again, to give you some kind of understanding of how different that world was. For any of you who have been to Israel, you may have been to Ein of Dat. This is a canyon. There are a series of uh, uh, pools of springs. You're looking at a spring right there. Um, every, every high school group does the hike here. You go hike through the canyon and there's a way to climb up the cliff. It's quite spectacular, and I did it in 1971. What they don't tell the high school kids is that right on top of the cliff here is an archaeological site that's 60,000 years old. And it's, a, it's an incredible site. It's about, oh, you know, I don't know acres. It's about 1.6 dunam, 1,600 square meters. Okay, I, don't, I don't, can't translate that into, I don't know acres. But um, one of the largest middle Paleolithic sites in the country, an open air site. And we have pollen, which has trees. And you see the trees are very, there's very dense jungle growth here. But what's really interesting about this site is that it's in alluvial sediments, river 
laying sediments on top of the cliff, which means the cliff didn't exist, which means this whole canyon didn't exist 60,000 years ago. There was a running river where people roughly at the grade of Neanderthals, they were either archaic Homo sapiens or Neanderthals, we don't have any fossil material, living on the edge of a running river in an area which today receives four inches of rain a year, but then there was no canyon and there was a running river. That's the first rule that prehistoric archeologists have to learn. The modern landscape is not the ancient landscape. I take my students out here, uh, sometimes from the top, and uh, I show them, do you see the site? It's a really important site. And of course, they can't see it because it's just a flint scatter. There's no architecture. It's just a band of not yet Homo sapiens sapiens who were hunter-gatherers living on the edge of a river. And I say, okay, when we visit the site, and I actually don't have a picture of the site. Um, and uh, yeah. So did this valley get cut by that river? Over yes. Over the last, probably, let me just think, we have evidence for running water in that valley. There's no running water today. It's just flash floods up through 39,000 years ago. So we have a period prior to 30,000 years where we had a river. And then following that period, we have a severe erosional episode. The canyon is about 600 meters long. And I guess this is about 50 meters deep. So we have extremely rapid erosion uh, in the late Pleistocene here. Very important for climatic reconstructions and environmental reconstructions. Okay, so again, so you get an idea of the richness, the breadth of Negev archaeology. Um, the Nabataeans, uh, the Nabataean kingdom, we don't, Nabataeans are a little bit too mythological. You know, we, you see the Nabataeans in Indiana Jones, right? But they're, uh, the Nabataeans were a North Arabian kingdom who originated apparently, we're not sure about this, as nomads, and controlled the trade routes going from the tropics, from the Indian Ocean, up the Red Sea, and into the Mediterranean. Now, I, I, I need to explain why that's important. Think... Chanel, think perfume. Think of what an incredible industry that is. Think cosmetics. Think, and suddenly these, think medicinal, think uh, medicine. Uh, incense, I don't know, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area. For me, incense was head shops. Um, but no, now think about incense as used in the temple in Jerusalem and multiply that by thousands of temples, pagan temples throughout the Mediterranean or later on uh, the Catholic church. So we have medicinal herbs, we have perfumes, we have cosmetics, we have incense and we have spices. And we think of spices to, that, that make the food taste better. But pepper was used to preserve food. And these are five things which we take for granted, but which in the ancient world were luxury items. And the Nabataeans controlled the trade in these five things. So they became super wealthy, sedentized, and controlled the trade routes until the Romans conquered them in 106. They didn't even conquer them. The Romans came knocking on the door. You all, we all know what happened in 66 to 70. The Jewish kingdom fell to the Romans in a bloody, uh, bloody war. So the Romans came 30 years later to the Nabataeans and said, okay, guys, hand over the keys. And the Nabataeans did. So the Romans took over the Nabataean kingdom and it became a province of Rome. 
And that province of Rome ultimately becomes the desert. It becomes third Palestine and it becomes the Roman desert frontier. And in the Roman desert frontier, we have desert urbanism, which is absolutely spectacular. Um, people were harvesting water in the desert by stopping flash floods 2,000 years ago, blocking the flash floods, and farming in the wadis and growing wheat and barley, that's easy, olives, dates, figs, and wine, grapes. And we have texts indicating that they're exporting wine from the desert to the rest of the world. Because it's, and by the way, modern Israel turns out that we have really, really high quality boutique wineries in the Negev today. I used to be a vice president of my university. I used to deal with all these donors. We used to take them out to the Negev, to these boutique wineries, and they would buy cases of this great wine. And my university was always was doing all this wine research. We have a wine research center. So what you're seeing here, that's a Nabataean uh, temple, the remains. But these things, a church, oh, this is a, that's a church, a Byzantine church. That's part of a Byzantine church. That's a big Byzantine basilica. These are all the site. That's at Avdat. Those are at Shifta. Christianity enters the Negev in the 5th century CE, maybe late 4th century, maybe the late 300s, and becomes the dominant religion in the Negev, even to the point where Bedouin tribes, where nomadic tribes adopted Christianity. So we can actually study early Christianity in the Negev and early Islam because that's a very early mosque dating to about 700 CE. And what's fascinating about the Negev, you know, we have this stereotype of the Muslim conquests, but it is very, very clear from the Negev that the Muslim conquests weren't conquests, but infiltrations and replacements. The Byzantine empire fell and there were some battles between the Byzantines and the early uh, Muslims but not in the Negev. There was some kind of coexistence that went on in the Negev, which uh, we'll not go into in great depth. This is a more recent excavation at a site called Kubor Wuleda um, in the Northern Negev. And what you're looking at is a, uh, re, uh, what you're looking at is an Egyptian estate from about 1150 or 1200 BCE. That's what that building is. You can see our excavations and you can see that they were uh, processing either beer or wine, we're not sure which. And that, those are loom weights. Those are Philistine loom weights because right after the Egyptians, we have Philistines on this site. So again, a sequence of cultures over the long term. Sorry. On a hand loom. No, 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 that's fine. That's great. It's important. On a hand loom, you put out your loom and you have to attach weights to the warp to keep the, the, um, the cords tight. And then you pass the weft, weft underneath, under and over and under and over. But something has to keep those warp, um, the, the warp strings tight and even, so you attach weights to them. So loom weights are those weights that are holding those strings down and even. And I'm just jumping back and forth. This is a rock shelter uh, where we have um, stuff that dates back to 14,000 BC. It just, this is a site I, ex I discovered in the 1980s. We excavated in the early 1990s. And it was preserved because the whole top of the rock shelter fell down and just kept all those sediments in place. But just again, one little site. 
know that it was there? So because I'm a really good uh, surveyor. Because when you go, when no, I'm serious about that, but because when we went in to look, we could see the stone tools eroding out of an exposed section. And we could actually immediately identify what we had. And then when I looked carefully, I could see the section. We actually went and excavated that site. It's a little bit weird to excavate sideways. Uh, I'll go back. You can't really see it. No, it's not a good enough photo, but it's a huge block. It must weigh 100 tons that just fell off the roof and preserved the, the sediments. And uh, we had to excavate underneath that, so we had to excavate sideways, which is not the way we should usually excavate. Okay, now again, I want to give you some kind of idea of what we're doing in the field. And that's an area I worked in in the middle 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and we're doing pedestrian survey. And to give you an idea, you know, we're walking. But the interesting thing about this is why and who paid for it. Up until the discovery of gas in the Mediterranean, Israel was an energy poor country. And we had plans to build a power reactor, not a research reactor, which we have at Demona where of course you all know that's where we have, we built the bombs, which are a secret, so you didn't hear that. Um, but um, a proper power reactor to address Israel's energy problems, especially after we returned the oil wells in the Red Sea to Egypt, right? When we, re when we withdrew from Egypt, we gave back Abu Rodez. Well, you're all from California, you know about false, and you know about building power reactors, nuclear reactors on fault lines, because in California, it's been done. And uh, Israel was trying to avoid that problem. And they had all these geologists running around mapping all the faults. But it's a problem with dating faults. And one way to date faults is to hire archeologists to find archeological sites in different strata. And if you have an archeological site in the strata, you know what the date of the stratum is. So if the fault goes through the stratum, which you've dated by the site, then you know that it's act, the fault was active after the site was formed. If the fault doesn't go through the site, you know that the stratum or the fault doesn't go through the stratum, you know that the fault was dormant and never active after that period. So they hired us to do this great research. I don't know how effective the work we did was in terms of solving that problem, but this is an example of a very small hunter-gatherer camp from 14,000 years ago. You can't see it at all, but every rock, this is a dune. It's a sand dune. Every rock you see on this slide was brought in by people, and the vast majority are flint. So they're artifacts. The entire site was a quarter of the size of this room. Actually, even it was 25 meters, square meters, 27 square meters. So even smaller than a quarter of the size of this room. With 6,000 artifacts, three hearths, it was a campsite from hunter-gatherers in the dunes in the late Pleistocene. Now we have dozens and dozens of these sites, right? It's not an unusual site, but this is the one I excavated and we were able to put the pieces of flint back together. We we're able to reconstruct the flint napping process on this site because it was in such perfect condition. It had apparently been buried by a blowing dune shortly after the people lived there and exposed again, maybe 30 years ago. Well, probably more because I excavated it 30 years ago, but probably 50 or 60 years ago, it was exposed because the top of the dune moved. So perfectly preserved. No organic material because it's just sand. The sand allows water to percolate through, but the artifacts were in perfect shape. And by the way, of course, only flint. Flint and, and limestone, and the limestone is there when you see the hearth, the hearth, which is exactly what you see there. 
those stones are burnt limestone, and that's a heart. So hunter-gatherers from 14,000 years ago in the Negev, we have all of this stuff. This is only a little bit later. This is a mere 11,000 years ago. And this is the first evidence we have for architecture in the desert. And what you see are hut bases. And you can see here, a round circle, you see slabs that are standing upright. See the same thing, these are two separate sites. Um, these are hunter-gatherer groups. They have no domesticated animals. There, we have mortars and pestles from the site, but there are no sickle blades. They're not doing agriculture and they couldn't possibly do agriculture in this region anyway. Can't grow anything. This particular area receives only three inches of rain a year. Okay. Um, so we have here architecture, not sophisticated architecture, but People building proper buildings, or hut bases at any rate, a very, very long time ago. And you see the flint pictures of the flint artifacts. So we see here scraping tools. We see here arrowheads. These are also a kind of arrowhead knives, a whole range of different artifact types. We can do spatial analyses on where these are, where we're finding these on the site, et cetera. Yeah. Do these items locations just reside where they are and you can walk over them at this point because they're now protected because it's, it's just a, an uncommon thing that you can go out there or okay that? um that's a i mean <laughs> let me let me so, yeah, sorry. oh sorry so the question is can we just do we just find these there do you just walk on them are they still there how do they preserve. One of, the, one of the great things about the desert is stuff doesn't get buried. It's a desert. You go into northern Israel, you have running rivers. You guys just experienced floods here. You know what that is. You, you got one in 100 year floods, but rivers, when they're not engineered by people, flood every year. Alluviation is a very common yearly occurrence. The Mississippi Valley is covered by floodplains, which are caused by the aggradation of sediments from the Mississippi overflowing every year. The entire Mississippi Valley, the entire Central Valley, even small valleys like here, they're all, it's all alluvium. So sites which are 500 years old and 1,000 years old and 2,000 years old and 10,000, they're buried because of the action of rivers. And we find them by accident, okay? We don't, it's very hard to find old archeological sites in areas where the geology is recent geology, not in the desert. There's no, there are no running rivers in the desert or there are, but they, they stopped running a million and a half years ago or 50,000 years ago. And even the ones that were running 50,000 years ago didn't have the spread that something like the Nile has. So, or for that matter, the Amazon, which is also covered by jungles. But you've seen the landscape here. You've seen, and again, <laughs> um, no vegetation cover. I worked in the desert, I worked on these surveys for about five years, you know, about 200, 200 days a year. I was there, I was out surveying every day. And the idea was you take a team, team was four or five volunteers and, and paid members. You go out, spread out 20 meters, 30 meters apart, and you walk up and down. You try to do it with the grain of the, of the terrain. I don't want to have to walk up and down and up and down and up and down all the time. I try to walk with the grain, with the wadis in the directions that are natural. And anytime a volunteer or me, anytime we find something suspicious, we stop and we register. And that's how in 100 square kilometers in my first map, I found 271 previously unknown archaeological sites. And they're all tiny. 
And if they're not on the surface, I don't find them unless by some chance I'm in a Wadi channel and I see something in a section, okay? So yes, if you're walking along today, you will find the sites. They're just there. I took a, a visitor out a few weeks ago to the desert and I showed her a Neolithic site. Now, I don't think you guys could see them. It requires a little bit of experience in the field to recognize what these things look like, but not a lot. I would train a volunteer in two weeks, not in the archeology, span but in seeing the anomalies in the field. And then calling me over and saying, Steve, I'm not sure about this. And then usually it would be a site, not always. And they're the, yes, they're there. People who don't recognize them, don't recognize them because they don't have the training. A lot of, by the way, biblical archeologists who are used to working on tells, who are used to digging city walls, digging in Jerusalem, uh, digging palaces, fortifications, temples. They won't see this site. They won't see it. Well, it's hard to actually see because we've excavated, but you see the surface here, or you see the surface here, and you can see that most of this is, was buried. But if you train, especially in prehistoric archaeology, you see, you see the hints, you see the clues. And of course, if you're looking for the artifacts, I still remember a woman who today is a senior scientist at the Israel Geological Survey was then a BA student working with me in the field. And she had studied Flint. And she started working, walking around that site up there and said, Steve, look, it's just like in the textbooks, these artifacts. She was very excited, and rightly so. Yes. Only the northwestern Negev has active dunes. Most of the Negev is a rocky desert. I've worked in both areas. I've worked in all, all areas of the Negev, but um, most of the areas that I've worked in are the rocky areas. And the dunes, the dunes are a real problem because they're always shifting. So if you do a survey in the dunes and you find stuff, and then you go back 20 years later, you won't find those sites because they've been covered, but you'll find new sites. So the dunes are the exception, quite right, a good question. The exception to what I was talking about. Yeah. Yes, but you splatter stuff. Again, you may want to repeat this for the people online, but I was talking, you know, you talked about this being everything on the surface, but in reality, a tell is exactly built on layers of layers of layers of civilizations on top of each other, and you have to dig down to see all those layers, right? So, yeah. yeah. When, when you, you dig, dig a tell, when you survey a tell, you survey all around it. And what you get are the sherds or stone tools of all the periods as they erode out from the sides, okay? Sometimes you don't see everything on a tell. Sometimes you can only understand the full history of the tell by digging a section or something. But a tell is such a unique landscape feature that you know it's a tell. It's not a natural hill. The features of a tell are unique. So, okay, let me go on. Uh, where am I? There. This is a rock shelter that I excavated in the mid 2000s up through 2012. And um, it's in the Ramon crater. And what you're looking at is a rock shelter without artifacts, but it's got a meter of bupkis, goat pellets. And when I first found this rock shelter, I'm, and again, personal perspectives, first found it in 1981 and we found some artifacts on the, on the slope of the rock shelter. And they were Neolithic and Epipaleolithic and I was very excited. And I thought we would find a, a Paleolithic rock shelter or a Neolithic rock shelter. And we dug a meter deep to bedrock and we found goat pellets. And I was sure they were Bedouin because the modern Bedouin use rock shelters to shelter their sheep mostly, but also goat. Uh, during uh, the winter. They're used as winter shelters for obvious reasons. They're sheltered, 
the animals are crunched together, they're preserving heat, all that. That was in 1981. In 19, sorry, in 2003, a group of Russian historical ecologists came to me and said, we're interested in reconstructing climatic history in the Holocene. And we need a license. We need somebody, we need an archeologist to work with us because we can't get a dig license. And you've excavated this thing. We want to look at the section. I said, sure, but I think it's all modern. And they went and did a bunch of radiocarbon dates on this section. And they found dung pellets, goat dung pellets from 8,000 years ago. The earliest evidence for the presence, direct evidence for the presence of goat, domestic goat in the desert. The earliest, and I don't like to use the word Bedouin, but this is, these are the precursors to modern Bedouin. The, the earliest penetration of domestic animals into the desert. Now we think about desert adaptations today, you all think of Bedouin, which are sheep, which are primarily camel in the deep desert, and around the edges of the desert, sheep and goat. Well, they didn't have camels. Camels were not domesticated until, until much later. We were able to reconstruct the ecological history and the history of pastoralism in the desert based upon a meter of dung pellets. Now, some of this was great. I worked with a biochemist who analyzed the, the chemistry of the pellets. And he told me, well, it's late, late winter, early spring because they're eating shoots because the density of proteins or lipids uh, is really high. And you can only get that if you eat, eat fresh shoots. If they were there in the summer, the density of lipids would be really, really low. So we actually were able to say, okay, this is when these pastoralists were there. I worked with some DNA, paleo DNA people in Dublin in the University of Dub at Trinity College in Dublin. Oh yeah, you have a really early variant of domesticated goat, the early Levantine variant of domesticated goat. Perfect date, 6,000. I mean, I told him 6,000. He said, oh yeah, that's the date of the other DNA we have from this variant of domestic goat taken from bupkis. You know, bupkis is the Yiddish word for goat pellets. Uh, so I actually haven't written them. Someday I'm gonna write a paper, uh, much ado about bupkis, you know, and something <laughs> like that. Uh, oh, so I even have a picture of this. Here are the pellets. And those pellets you see are 8,000 years old. The latest thing I have with these, with these pellets is I sent them to, not the 8,000 year old ones. They're only 5,000 years old. I sent them to a lab in, at University College London where they do gut microbes. There's a microbe called LAC, L-A-K. And I don't really understand this at all. It's beyond me and it has nothing to do with the archeology. span But you know, it's really weird to see people excited about bupkis, about goat pellets. And they, they were able to extract the DNA of this virus, which is a classic gut microbe. And now they're doing the history of the evolution of this gut microbe from goats. They, they're not even convinced. And I keep explaining to them, guys, this is sealed. This is, there's nothing, we've radiocarbon dated these pellets half a dozen times already. They're totally sealed under another half a meter of accumulated pellets. There's no disturbance, the nothing. The, the strata are totally intact. And they say, yeah, but the preservation of the DNA is too good. And I, I explained to them, guys, there's no water here. This, this, first of all, they're getting only four inches or three inches of rain a year here. But second, the rock shelter itself faces south. And these samples were taken from inside. No water is going to get in here at all. I haven't, they're really worried about contamination because DNA is, is terrible for contamination. But it's 
unless it's lab contamination. But I've given them like five pellets already and they, they keep coming up with the same thing. So all sorts of crazy stuff you discover, which you can never know you're gonna get. It's one of the beauties of doing science. And for me, archeology, span uh, discover new stuff. The fact that we can determine the season of um, occupation of the rock shelter allows me to reconstruct the entire seasonal round of these ancient peoples. And the other thing about this study was the modern Bedouin are totally different. The pattern, because we have modern pellets up there on top, is totally different. The, the seasonality is totally different, which gives us something else very important to understand. The modern Bedouin are modern. They're not a throwback. They're not a fossil. They're not primitive. Modern Bedouin adaptations are modern and they're totally different in their basic structures and configurations from the ancient Bedouin. Yeah. It looks like a bunch of rocks. I can't. No, it's not rocks. It's compressed dung. It's all compressed dung. The one, that one are individual dung pellets that I was able to extract. The rock shelter is complex and we find dung pellets in different layers in different forms. Sometimes it's just powder. Sometimes, as you see, the pellets are intact. Sometimes we're getting actual carbon rocks because the urine of the, of the, uh, of the animals has compacted, has interacted chemically. And sometimes we're just getting compacted clusters. So if I were to break that apart, those things apart, you could see the molds of the individual pellets. So um, part of our job is to try to understand what causes the different facies of the, uh, of the pellets. What, what, are, what are the micro environmental conditions that cause these differences? I rely on a, a micromorphologist to do that. Not, <laughs> I do stone tools, I mean. Archaeology has become very, very uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Okay, this is the site I excavated with Yaniv, which I began to talk about at the beginning of this talk. And what you're looking at is a shrine. You see that wall there, which after excavations, we know it once stood this high, as high as the middle of my chest. So a meter and a half high, 20 meters long, and when you and you see in this picture that it's directly facing an a dorm, a dormant, an extinct volcano, okay, which was buried and then exposed in the erosion of the crater. And it's between two hills. So you see a very nice alignment. And if you were to visit this site, as we have, on the solstice, on the longest day of the year, June 21st, the sun sets right there. So there's no question that this is cultic. There are four of these shrines. There are 30 burial tumuli, burial cairns. Oh, well, I can show you. And here is the setting sun of the summer solstice. I think this was 2001. And we're looking directly at the wall. And you see the sun setting between the hills, over the Black Mountain, and directly over the shrine. This, we have, uh, we have dates, we have radiocarbon dates, and we have optically stimulated luminescence dates from this site, 7,000 years ago, 5,000 BC. Now I have a whole narrative of where these things came from and how they developed and how they're connected to these pastoral tribes and all of this kind of stuff. You can see how large some of the stones are. Some of the stones weigh 400 kilo. 400 kilo is a thousand pounds. We know where they were schlepping them from. They were schlepping from them from about 200 or 300 meters away. They were quarrying them out of exposed limestone layers, dragging them. Each shrine, you do an estimate, weighs about 30 tons. 
we're talking about small tribal groups. 30 tons, 60 days of work to build it. So if you have a group of 10 men, six days, okay? In the middle of nowhere, with very, and literally in the middle of nowhere, okay? Um, this is pretty powerful cult, and it is probably related to developing territoriality as these people became ever more dependent on their goats. So we're seeing here the social transition from small bands of hunter-gatherers to tribes of pastoralists. And I wrote a whole book about this. So I, I can't, if I could write a whole book, I could talk all night to you about this and I'm not going to, because I'm just trying to give you a, a little taste of a few things. But that's, um, there's the cairn and you see how big the cairn is. And that is a former student of mine who is now a senior excavator at, is in the Israel Antiquities Authority. So, okay. Um, so again, a special story from the Negev. By the way, not unique to the Negev, although I'm the first person to excavate one of these things in this way. And then this is the other part of that site, which you saw at the very beginning. Now, I want to talk about another thing. I'm Metallurgy is the basis of everything we do in the modern world. Okay, the, uh, everything, everything is based on metals. Now everything is based on the internet, but you couldn't have the internet without metals. And um, the earliest metallurgy anywhere is in Bulgaria. However, we have contemporary metallurgy in the Northern Negev. What you're seeing there is the Nahal Mishmar Horde in the Judean desert, which was discovered in 1965, 64, by Pesach Bardo. It was a cave where he found a, a cache of over 400 beautiful cultic copper objects. The copper came from Jordan. It came from uh, the copper source area of Fainan. We didn't know that then, but we know that now. But the copper was worked in different regions. And in Beersheva, on the banks of the Wadi, there are three archaeological sites which were excavated originally in the 1950s. And I had the privilege of working at one of them, two of them, in the 1980s and 1990s where we have evidence for the working of copper at 4200 and 4300 BCE, okay? So that's the bottom of the furnace, of the very, very primitive furnace. And that's another site called Shikmim, which a friend of mine excavated in the same, along Wadi Beersheba. That culture, became famous and is called the Beersheba culture because it's got the earliest metallurgy in the Near East. That's not quite true. It's got the earliest evidence for systematic smelting because you can, you can work metal without smelting it. And systematic smelting means industry, means common. And uh, this is one of the, in the middle of nowhere, I mean, we're talking about Beersheba, Beersheba. Who goes to Beersheba? And yet here we have this center of metallurgy at 4300 BC. That by the way is a churn and it's evidence for very, very early dairying in the same period. Uh, that's another story altogether and I won't go into that. There's another site they excavated in the central Negev and Eve also worked there. This is a little tiny site. Um, it's about 20 meters by 20 meters. It's a campsite from 3000 BC. And what you see is a room, a room, a room, a room, and some rooms, and then uh, enclosures. We excavated the site very carefully. You see the reconstruction, you see after excavation, you see the site plan. 
But what's really interesting is what we found. So these rocks on the bottom here, the black rocks, those are obsidian. They came from 800 kilometers away. The nearest source of obsidian is Turkey. We actually did tests on the obsidian, chemical tests to determine, to determine the source. And they came from Eastern Anatolia, okay, from the Lake Van area. We can determine it very, very closely by the uh, elemental, phys elemental chemistry of the things. So we have very, very long distance trade. We have the production of beads. These are drills. These are each about a centimeter long. You attach them to an, a, a, a haft and you create a bow drill and you have a very effective drill, which is how all ancient peoples made beads. And here we have the beads. And here we have the raw material of the beads, ostrich eggshells. And we have trade in beads. In the middle of the desert, this family group is actually engaged in a whole range of activities and they're trading with the sedentary societies. What we have here is a milling stone whose source is in the Martesh Ramon about 10 kilometers away and they're schlepping blocks of sandstone 10 kilometers up the mountain, working it at this site and then trading it 80 kilometers north. We have metallurgy. They're not doing the metals on the site. They're scavenging bits and pieces of metal from other sites and trading that to places where they can work the metal. We have this, this is unfortunately not in color. Those are pink quartz crystals found locally, which they're being traded. So we have this very, very early nomads, 3000 BC, in deeply engaged with the sedentary societies. And I won't, again, go into it. Um, there's a whole book about this site. Here you have a camel. This is a camel, which we think is roughly Nabataean in age, but it's very, it's, a, it's obviously a painting on a rock shelter, red paint, probably some kind of iron base. But I wanna point out the funny horns on the hump. And that's a special kind of saddle called the North Arabian saddle. And the North Arabian saddle, we know only came into use in the Hellenistic period. And that's what enabled people to fight on camelback. It was a major technological advance. And here we have it in a rock shelter in the negative. Yes. So, you know, again, the question of preservation of something like that, is this it's in a rock shelter, it's protected. If that had been outside, it would have uh, worn off. But is it something that is just out there and there's no sign that say, hey, come visit this? It's I have not published this because it will be vandalized yeah. if I expose it. There are other things which, uh, I mean, I publish the regular things. They're not, there's no, this is the kind of thing which, which would be vandalized. And I'll get to that immediately in the next slide. I have three students who have worked on or are working on Negev rock art. We have tens of thousands of panels of rock art in the Negev, beautiful things. And dating from about 5,000 years BP, BC up until recent Bedouin rock art. And I won't go into the details. I just wanna point out that it's really spectacular stuff. And yes, we have a problem with vandalism. One of my students, the one who pioneered this work, um, was involved with the Parks Authority in creating, creating an experimental rock art tourist site. And yes, there is a problem with vandalism. And we have no idea how to address that problem because there's so much there, you can't possibly patrol it. And people have access to this, this stuff all the time. Um, there's nothing, now vandalism is one problem. We don't really have a problem of looting. 
because nobody's searching for gold in the desert. It was a very serious problem of looting in the rest of Israel. If you find an Iron Age Israelite period pot or a pot from the time of Jesus, those things have a great deal of value on the black market. There's also a whole market for fakes, which are passed off as real. These are issues which are very difficult. There's nothing, not, I mean, I'm an academic archeologist. I'm involved in these things, but it's not my primary job. My, my primary job is the research and it's the primary job of the Antiquities Authority to deal with these problems. But all of my students are in the Antiquities Authority. So what you see here are a whole range of different kinds of rock art, but notice in particular the beautiful Ibex, okay? And here you have people writing and here you have abstract symbols. And we actually can put together a sequence of the development of the rock art. There's a myth in archeology span that nomads don't leave remains, that we can't find the remains of nomadic peoples. That's a myth and it's wrong. And what you're looking at here are, is a Nabataean campsite. After I, clean, after I cleaned it and after I excavated it, but each of those lines of stone that you see is a, a tent base. It's interesting that they're circular. They're not Bedouin tent bases. Nowadays, a lot of people, they, they see the Bedouin, they think they're models for ancient times, and of course they're not. This gives direct evidence of very, very different kinds of tents. And here we have a view of how we actually excavated it and what the features are. And we can, we can find camps, tent camps in the desert. And they're pretty common if you know how to look for them. And larger scale camps. This is actually an early Islamic camp. Dates to about 650 to 700, maybe even a little later. And I don't want to go into detail, but I do want to show you two very, very early mosques. They're desert mosques. And we can actually add a significant chapter to the, to the origins of Islam by looking at what's happening in the desert. Because of course, Islam came out of the desert. It's primarily a city religion. We don't tend to think of it that way, but it primarily is a city religion. It came out of Mecca and Medina. Mm -hmm. But we find very, very early manifestations in the desert, in the Negev, these are two sites, these are two mosques that I found and investigated. So, yeah. Oh. You notice the alignment? Uh, mosques are aligned so that when you pray, you face Mecca. These two are precisely aligned to face Mecca. The upper one, um, the mihrab, the prayer niche, is, was destroyed in antiquity. But it's very clear where it was because there's a blank in the wall. Um, and then the lower one uh, has a standing stone, a uh, matseva in Hebrew, a stella in English, marking the direction of prayer. So uh, I, my, my uh, Middle Eastern colleagues they have all confirmed that these are mine. Very, very early and open air mosques. There's no vault, there's no roof. These are nomadic mosques. This is a site that I showed a brief picture of earlier, uh, Kubur Waleda, a Philistine, Egyptian Philistine site. I just wanna show, I showed you this slide earlier, but here are mud brick walls. This is the Northern Negev. You can see the mud bricks preserved. And look at the goodies. Look at the really spectacular finds that we found uh, from this Egyptian Philistine site. And you asked earlier about the tents. We dig under shades now. And then, um, only a sample of my students. And they were actually my greatest discovery. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm
I kind of feel I didn't even give you enough, but I spoke for a long time. So you mentioned the copper smelting area. Um, sorry. Um, do you know why it was there particularly that it was smelted? What we have is a concentration of villages in Beersheba. Beersheba is a unique location because there's a very high aquifer there. That's why it's called Beersheba uh, with the stress on Be'er, on wells. Um, you have easy access to water. So that within a, say, three kilometer radius of the downtown modern Beersheba, you must have a dozen Chalcolithic villages. Okay, and when you have that concentration, now the Chalcolithic period is a period of uh, evolving society. So for example, we can look in the Chalcolithic and we see very clearly craft specialization in pottery, in certain kinds of flint tools. We see trade. So we have craft specialists in Beersheba. Uh, and um, one of those crafts would have been working, uh, working the metal. It, it, then it becomes a question of simple of demography. There's a market there. Yeah. Sure. Arthur, you're unmuted. Arthur, ask your question. All right. Do you want to read it? Uh, okay. Oh, very, very late. Let me think for a second. So in Sinai, in the late Bronze Age, we have Sinaitic, which is a kind of very early language, uh, sorry, very early alphabet. There's a dispute as to whether it's the earliest alphabet, but it's very early and it's obviously rela related to uh, Egyptian mining activities. Um, by the Iron Age, we don't have anything earlier than that, and not in terms of writing. In the Iron Age, we have ostraca, we have inscriptions, um, we have rock art with written materials. There's a site called Kuntilat Ajrud, which is just on the other side of the border in Egypt, which has depictions of Yahweh and his consort, Asherah, with written descriptions as well. And that's eighth century BCE. But we don't have anything, for example, we have writing in Egypt going back to 3000 BC, maybe even uh, a little bit earlier in terms of some of the hieroglyphs. In Mesopotamia, we have late fourth millennium writing, uh, uh, hieroglyphs and, and that kind of, uh, not hieroglyphs, cuneiform. But in, in Israel in general, we have only very late, much later writing. Part of it is probably that um, unlike Mesopotamia, which used clay tablets, which preserve forever, once they're burnt, they preserve their rock. Um, in Israel, we think that the major form of writing was on papyri, papyrus, which doesn't preserve. So we have rock inscriptions, which are basically Iron Age is the answer, not much before the Iron Age at all. Uh, Dr. Rosen, thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, I'm uh, actually planning to introduce Yaniv to introduce you tomorrow. <laughs> and one of the things I hope to say is imagine two gentlemen sitting down to dinner at a Shabbat dinner in Israel. And one of them turns to the other and says, oh, so uh, do you have any kids? Oh, yeah, my son lives in California. Oh, yeah, my son lives in California, too. Oh, my son works at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Oh, my son works at National Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And the fact that 
I got a call from my father saying, you have to look up Yaniv Rosen. His dad is a professor <laughs> at Ben Gurion University. And I just met him last night at my, at my, at my, sister, uh, my sister's house, Miriam. so, Miriam's. So what an amazing story. So I called Yaniv and, uh, and, and here we are today. So it's just an amazing small world. Yeah, Jeff has been world. bugging me to meet you for a long time. So. It's such a small world. But so uh, thank you, first of all, for coming to Beth Emick and for coming to visit your son for Passover, Absolutely. right? my pleasure. And uh, we look forward to again to tomorrow's presentation. And if anyone's interested, I could actually probably give you the WebEx for someone who wants it. My, my question was on Masada. And is, that's part of the Negev still, right? Or is it? And does that count? And um, where is the earliest mikvah found or, or have they been found in some of these scenarios? Because I, I, I expect that that is something that is within Jewish excavations of sites dating back over 2000 some odd years. Thank you. Masada is in, in, in the Judean desert. And it depends on where you draw the borders of the th these things. But the Judean desert for me is not really the Negev, not because I'm prejudiced. I have a very, I have a good colleague at Hebrew University whose expertise is the Judean desert. And he's a, a generation and a half younger than me. And he actually told me, what you did with the Negev, I want to do with the Judean desert. And the difference between the two is the Judean desert is very much integrated into the settled zone, okay? Um, it's, it's really, when you look at the cultures of the Judean desert, they're an extension, even the Neolithic cultures, they're an extension of what's happening next door, five, 10 kilometers away in, uh, in Judea, where even though it's really, really dry, there's a kind of overflow, a cultural and social overflow. Um, so Masada is really a part of that. It's not really, I mean, I've talked about Masada because it's, you know, classic sign. I found, had some interesting experiences about Masada. You know, Masada, since you've asked, is a focus of um, controversy. Uh, Masada, the, the history is pretty clear. Um, you had a Herodian palace, one of a series of Herodian palaces, which was, um, manned by Jewish garrison during the Roman war, then taken over by the Romans. And then the zealots uh, basically kicked the Romans out, probably slaughtered the, the Roman garrison there and, and took it over during the revolt. And then there was uh, whatever happened there, but there was most certainly a, a major Roman presence trying to wipe out this nest of, of uh, revolutionaries. But all of the, and we, we have the Roman camps, we have the Roman ballista, we have the destruction of the gate. We have a lot of evidence for that battle. What we don't have is uh, evidence for um, Josephus's account of what actually happened and all the suicide and all that. And it's very, very suspect because what happened in Masada exactly parallels even to the lots of what Josephus said happened at Yotfat. Okay, Yotfat, Josephus, for those of you who don't know, was the commander of the Jewish forces in the Galilee. He was a, he was a noble, he was a Jewish nobleman. He commanded the forces and um, he got defeated. And he describes the defeat and he says, they're all holed up in this cave at Yotfat and they decide to kill each other, to kill one another. They decide to suicide and they draw lots and he's the only one left and he survives. And that's exactly the story of the son. It's probably not right in either case. Josephus was writing within a Roman tradition of literary history. He was also writing specifically against Roman anti-Semitic authors. And the name of the book is against Appian, because Appian was a Roman author who was attacking the Jews, literarily, in, in, in his histories. So Josephus is writing a polemic. If you don't read his stories of the Jewish wars as a polemic, you're misunderstanding 
the way Romans wrote history, the way ancient people wrote history, and you're misunderstanding his personal agenda and his personal history. So that answers, I think, most of your questions about Masada and the Judean desert. Judean desert is a really fascinating place. And I leave it to my colleague at Hebrew University to really explore it in depth, but yeah. The one thing that you didn't Oh, sorry. So there's a mikvah at Masada, which is a very early mikvah. I think we have mikvahs that are Hellenistic, okay? I think there are mikvahs that are, you know, 100, 200 years earlier. But as uh, I'm a prehistorian, I could look it up for you easily. But if you Google, you know, mikvah, ancient mikvah, you'll probably find the same thing that I find. So the, the, so the site that you first talked about that was 700 BCE? No evidence for a mikvah no, there. No, a Jewish location that had... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole issue, there was a recent series of articles, um, I don't remember who wrote them, because it's again, not my field, uh, but a, a, a recent series of articles that appeared in, in the American Schools of Oriental Research newsletter, and these were, kind of um, authors writing summaries of their books. And, and this author was writing about when do Jews become recognizably Jews? When would we see historically Jewish behaviors which we could identify with and we could actually say, okay, this is pretty similar to what we, we know. And, and he basically said it really only happens in the Hellenistic period. It really only happens well after the return from the exile. So that's about the depth I can give you. So over the last, let's say, 15,000 years, was the Negev as climatologically inhospitable the whole time as it is today? And if it was, does that imply that the people that live there weren't powerful enough to occupy the nicer real estate? <laughs> That's actually a really good question because I haven't addressed the issue of climatic change. And of course it's a hot issue. There are periods where the Negev was probably a step. We have good evidence based on isotopic analysis of dated snail shells. Another thing that I talk about in recent research, which suggests, for example, that at 5,000 BC or 4,000 BC in areas south of Beersheba, they were getting as much as 300 millimeters of rainfall a year. Now I'm gonna translate because I don't know the scientists here undoubtedly think in, in metric, but um, that's six inches. Sorry, 300 millimeters. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, uh, 300 millimeters is- uh, 200 to the inch, so it's- yeah. Yeah, 12, so it's um, 12 inches. 12 inches is not a lot of rainfall, okay? It, it's, it's a step. And um, we're talking about pre significantly pre-agriculture. So what you would have was a prairie, okay? Uh, the areas farther north would have been much richer. The primary animals that you would find in that period would have been gazelle, and we do have those. And in the rocky areas, ibex. But when we when we dig up the sites and we find the bones, it's all gazelle. And I found these things. Um, interestingly, it's not the desert gazelle; it's the mountain gazelle. So the climate is somewhat ameliorated. But if you go back to eighteen thousand years ago, it's even drier than today. If you go back to 25,000, basically what we have is a fluctuating climate, okay? Um, and the, the, the reasons for these fluctuations are varied, but you never get more than a step. The best you ever get is a step. We have what's called the mid or the Holocene optimum. And that's probably 6,000 BC. And that's again a step. And then right after that, we have a major, Fluctuation gets really dry for a short period and then wet again. 
So it's always changing because there are all of these factors that affect the climate, but it is always arid or semi-arid and sometimes hyper-arid, but never better than semi-arid. You have to go back really early to the um, middle Pleistocene to get anything that's really wet. And there was a second part to your question, which I've lost. Oh, did, did that imply that the people ah. were creatures? No. In fact, what we seem to have are, well, there are weird things going on. For example, at say, well, the site I showed you in the Mokhtashomong of the huts, okay? That site is about, it's 10,000 BC. Yeah, yeah, about 10,000 BC. Right after that, we have a major abandonment. We don't really know why. We have no sites from the pre-pottery Neolithic A in the Negev. No sites, not a, not a single site that we can date to the heart, which by the way, is the origins of major villages in the center of the country. That's when we have Jericho. That's when we have the wall and tower of Jericho in the pre-pottery Neolithic A. We have really spectacular sites. That's, by the way, when you have uh, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, the famous site, uh, cult site. So we have an abandonment. And then in the pre-pottery Neolithic B, which in the Negev is still hunter-gatherers, we have a recolonization of the Negev. Now, why is that weird? Because the pre-pottery Neolithic B is the heartland of the Levantine Neolithic. It's where we have the domestication of wheat, the dom domestication of barley. It's where we have the domestication of goats and sheep towards the end of the period, the very end, we even may have the domestication of cattle, okay? We have huge villages. The student I showed you a picture of standing in front of the cairn, just finished excavations of a 16 hectare size site in Moza in the Judean Hills, largest PPNB site, pre pottery Neolithic site in the Middle East so far. It won't stay that way, but in the meantime, it's huge. So we have village farming and village, uh, village farm or farming villages that have developed in this period. And for whatever reason, this is a period where we see the colonization of the Negev by hunter-gatherers. There are people who have left this developing farming system for whatever reason, and I'm not gonna go into that because I have no idea. And they moved into the desert. Now, admittedly, the desert in this period was a steppe, not a hyper-arid desert. But why would you leave the development of farming and go backward, quote, backwards, because of course it, we're talking about adaptations and adaptations are not progressive in some sense. They're adapted to the desert. They're, and they, they go out to the desert. Now, we don't know why, but there's a colonization of the desert in this period. We have a number of periods where the desert is empty. And I haven't talked about that. And then gets recolonized. In many cases, the recolonization, for example, the last, the side I showed you with all the goodies. It's clear that in this period, the metallurgy is playing a major role. The fact that the metal sources, the copper sources are in Sinai, Timna, and Fainan, all in the desert. It's clear that this is a draw for pastoralists living in the desert. It's part of their economy. And there, we get other things that are part of the economy, the trade in semi-precious stones, which we call semi-precious, but probably were quite precious. Turquoise is a semi-precious stone, but in ancient times, it had all sorts of magical properties. So what we see in the desert is people going in and leaving all the time. It's not a function of, call it political power, they, they are politically weaker, but they have the advantage of knowing the desert. They have the advantage of being adapted to the desert. Um, the Assyrians 
have serious problems when they launch campaigns in the Iron Age against desert people on the outskirts of Iraq. The Romans never quite succeed in subjugating the desert tribes. They do succeed in buying them off, but they don't actually, and by the way, there's a whole series of, there are a whole series of studies about the, um, uh, the Saracens and how the Romans bought them off and then finally got, the Romans got overthrown because they ceased paying the subsidies. So not weakness, that's not the way I would describe it. I would describe it as this give and take, um, constant give and take. These are complex economies. So, yeah. So, new topic. No, my, my pleasure. So I, the, the cairns that you showed earlier, these are burial cairns? Yes. So. Given the advances in the last couple of years of extracting ancient DNA, have there been any analyses done recently as to, you know, who, who these people are and, and who are their closest descendants? I, I am ever grateful to my students because I exploit their researches. I give them credit. I have a student who working on my grant money and with me has just finished his PhD excavating a bunch of these. The preservation in these cairns is terrible. It's really, really poor. The bones do not preserve well enough to extract DNA. And I, I don't know, I have colleagues who work in Jordan and I, I don't know if they've succeeded in extracting DNA, and I don't, don't know if they've even tried. But um, one of the really, everything is really interesting for me, I'm sorry. One of, the, one of the strange paradoxes of the Cairns is, so my student excavated, I think, 10 Cairns. Six in one Cairn field and four in another. The four in the second were much later, and they're probably reuses. I have another colleague who excavated probably few dozen cairns in the central Negev highlands. Uh, this colleague who excavated these sites in the 1980s, 1990s, found bones in 10% of the cairns. The others were profoundly empty. My student doing a much more detailed study, but I don't think that my friend Moti uh, missed the bones, discovered that he found bones in all the cairns, all six cairns he excavated, but not at the basal level. In the three cairns that I excavated at the site that I showed you, the cairn site, I found bones in the basal level of all the sites. So what we have are cairns with no bones at all, cairns with bones in the basal levels, and cairns with bones in upper levels. And I, I'm not gonna go into the details of that. In some of the cases, it's clear that the bones are redeposited. They're not primary burials. If you think about what happens to Joseph in the Bible, his bones are collected and reburied. This, when we look at biblical archeology span and the excavation of biblical Iron Age tombs, that is really common. Bones are collected, tombs are reused, bones are shoved aside. What we're seeing in the cairns is elaborate mortuary rituals. We're not used to this. We bury someone and we let them rest in peace. Okay, we don't, it's, it, we're not supposed to bother them after they're interred. Ancient peoples didn't work that way at all. They were constantly playing with these things, moving things around, taking body parts. In the pre-pottery Neolithic A, we get skull burials. Skulls are removed from the skeletons, probably after defleshing or letting the flesh rot. Then they're plastered. 
And they're apparently plastered in some cases deliberately to imitate the features of the deceased. In other cases, totally symbolically, okay? Because in some cases they're grotesque. They're not, uh, they're not real, uh, realistic at all. So that mortuary practices are not what we are used to. They're very elaborate. They take place over long periods, sometimes over years. If you're waiting for all the flesh to disappear, you're waiting years for, for that to happen before you're going into the tomb and then re removing either the skull or the entire burial and reburying it. In the Negev, we seem to have initial burial, removal, and reburial. And then in some cases, we have evidence for reorganization. Those cairns are reused. They're probably family cairns or something like that. Uh, I have one with three separate burials on the surface or uh, on the bottom. You know. um, so, and they're obviously not three people who died at the same time. And in one case, and again, I didn't show you all of this because it's a whole lecture in and of itself. The skull is placed between the long bones, between the leg bones. So they're doing all sorts of weird things, reorganizing the bones in very complex rituals, which we have no way of reconstructing. But again, to tie this in so you get an idea, these are the people, these are the same people who are aligning their shrines to the setting sun of the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. Uh, they're building 30 ton shrines. Now, 60 man days or 60 person days of work, when in the preceding period, there is no centralized shrine, no centralized worship. But think about the celestial idea. Somehow you now have symbolism, which attaches to the setting sun of the summer solstice. Not only symbolism, because all ancient, all homo sapiens have very complex symbol systems. It's public symbol systems. It's monumental symbol systems. So what we have is the need to declare publicly these symbols. We had a change in labor organization because 60 days of work for a society that didn't have anything like that in the previous phase is a major change for a non-utilitarian function. And now we know already from Marx Religion is a tool, right? It's a social tool. And it, it works in positive ways and works in negative ways, but it, it functions within society in certain ways. And that's what we're seeing. And the burials are, uh, are complex. They're not simple interments. By the way, one of the things is they're not burials. Okay, you build this, these, those cairns and the cairns look solid, right? But actually, Think about if you build a cairn with rocks, you're just building it with rocks. 20% of the cairn is air because there are interstices between the rocks. Well, over the course of the last 7,000 years, those interstices have filled with uh, lust, with aeolian dust. But when they were originally buried, they were just really kind, a kind of exposure. So the, the bodies were protected from hyenas. It's quite spectacular, by the way, to see a hyena in the Negev in the field, wild. A little bit scary, but you're in the Jeep, so. But it's spectacular to see the animals in the wild. But when, you, when those, those people were buried, it was actually a form of exposure. They were protected from, from carrion eaters, but they weren't protected from all the microbes that break down bodies, which they are if you bury them in the ground or more protected if you, they're not buried. They're really, it's a form of exposure. So it's, um, it's not obvious, it's not obvious. So was the actual Rachel's tomb likely a cairn as opposed to whatever it is today? I have no idea. I don't remember the history of Rachel's tomb. The patriarch's tombs 
are um, Roman. Okay, they go back to Roman period. Uh, sorry. Machpelah is Roman. The tombs themselves are probably Hellenistic. Okay. Beyond that, archaeology is not going to answer that question. And it's not going to answer the question for all sorts of reasons. Part of which are the science probably can't answer the questions. And more significantly, the politics won't allow anybody to touch those questions. And to be honest, I wouldn't want to touch those questions. No. Sorry? Oh, I'm whatever. I'm happy to. I don't have any. Okay. Do we have more questions? Or? Good. Thank you again, Dr. Rosa. That was great. Really enjoyable. And thank you for sharing all your stories with us. And thank you to all of you who attended. Please be on the lookout for more programming coming your way from CBE. Have a great night. Yes, there's lots of food. Everybody at home watching, it'll still be here if you come on down. <laughs>